Hey, yo, it's me, Pops Fan Marmalade, and you're watching the Comics Related Madness Network. Uh-huh. So come get some. Cromcon. Cromcon. Hey, we want to shout out to our sponsors, Daytona Beach Comic Con. If you are a fan of comic books, if you're a fan of comic book conventions, and if you like meeting comic book creators and getting comics and comic related stuff, then you need to make your plans to attend Daytona Beach Comic Con. This year's show is September 7th and 8th. Silverline will be there, so you should make your plans to be there too. We'll see you there. If you like comics and find yourself in the Orlando, Florida area, I mean, doesn't everyone come to Orlando at some point in time to see the House of Mouse? But when you're here, you need to make it a point to visit Coliseum of Comics, especially the one on East Colonial Drive. They carry Silverline Comics, even a limited edition Coliseum of Comics version of our comics. So, when you go, be sure to ask for Silverline Comics and tell them we sent you. OCD stands for Orlando Collector Deviants. OCD, Stephen Trish. They're a family of geeks who promote geek things, particularly those around the Orlando, Florida area. They're big supporters of Silverline, and we think you should be supporters of theirs, too. Go give them some love. If you are an independent comic book maker, and you need to get your independent comics made, you need to look no further than Kablam! Kablam Digital Printing. They print our books, and they do a bang-up job. They're not only trusted by Silverline, but many, many independent comic book makers. Head on over to Kablam.com and see for yourself just how easy it is to have your comic printed by them and tell them Silverline sent you. Hi, this is Tim TK, host of That Silverline Show on Tuesday. Join us at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, every Tuesday night as we discuss pop culture and the joys of making comics. Hi, I'm Barb Kelber, co-host of Silverline's Wednesday Wham. Join us each Wednesday nights as we discuss comics, literature, movies, and anything else that may catch our attention. I'm Roland Mann, and I host Silverline's Silver Sunday. Join me every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern as we make mine Silverline. Silver Sunday this Sunday night on February the 11th. How's everyone doing? Doing good. Woo-hoo. Good. I am your host. I am Roland Man, and I am joined by my usual cast of uh, collaborators, starting uh, with Miss Roberta Conroy. How are you this morning, Miss Roberta? I'm good. How are you? I am well. And of course, we have Mr. Mike Belcher, that man in the mask guy. Howdy, everyone. And, of course, we have Danny's friend, Mr. Tom Mason. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, special guest. <laughs> and getting in just in the nick of time. Under the wire. Under the Mr. Wire. Thomas Flormonti. What's howdy, up, Tom? Howdy, And, of course, we are joined tonight by our special guest, Mr. Danny Fingerroth, and we are going to ask him all kinds of questions about his life, about comic books, about uh, all of his time at Marvel and Spider-Man, of course, and of course, uh, the new thing he's got going, which he's going to be very excited to uh, tell us about, which you can peek at if you see just over his shoulder, just right there, right? So, um, so yeah, that's what we uh, are all about tonight. Uh, Say hi, Danny. Hello, I have a question for you. Okay. I hear there's some kind of football game tonight. <laughs> no, there's my, not. My, well, my you know, is, is having me on during the Super Bowl, it, does that mean, oh, nobody's going to watch this so we can, you know, we can have Danny on? Or, <laughs> oh, Danny's going to be the great well, competition for the, he'll attract everybody from the Super Bowl. Taylor so Swift will be watching this. So here's the thing, Danny. One of the things yeah. you, you got to you remember is that, uh, that I'm from the South, right? And as you can see, even what I'm wearing tonight, 
we don't care about professional football down here. Oh, yeah, our, we do. You're the only our, one that doesn't. No, make. no, no. I'm not the only one. Yes, our yeah, yeah. You are our the football only. season ended when the national championship, uh, collegiate national championship game was over. So well, I didn't realize there was still a football game going on. Do you kind of of that's what I hear. I, I, well, this will continue my record. I believe I have never watched the Super Bowl, so this will continue uh, my uh, wow. Streak. I can't say that. I can't say that I've never watched it. <laughs> but oh, it has some it's number the of years. Delivery system for chips and dip. Well, also, uh, Danny, and, and I'm surprised that that, uh, that you're not on this one. I, I thought that you would you would have realized by this point in time that that uh, sports and comics. Don't always really jive. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, but but sports, comics, and gorillas, though. I think if you add a gorilla to the mix, you well, would, if, listen. And, if there was and a dinosaurs. Gorilla, yeah, if there was a gorilla <laughs> or a dinosaur or a purple cover, and yeah. uh, in the Super Bowl, then I think comic book fans would tune in. I think know? I think they would. I think anybody who, uh, especially Julie Schwartz fans and Carmine yes. Tarantino fans, that <laughs> that might be the greatest comic book cover ever. Right with the with the gorillas playing in the World Series. There's a gorilla sliding into home plate. I just yes. There's a strange sports stories. That, yeah. That, was that Mitch Bird? He, no, Mitch that was that's a, it goes back to the '60s. It's oh, yeah. okay. Are oh, you talking about an older one? All right, I got yeah. You. It's, it's, it's Julie Schwartz. It's Carmine, I think. Yeah, Carmine and probably um, Murphy. But yeah, it's because it's, yeah. Mitch did some strange sports stories for you guys for for Malibu. Yes, he did. But we that's because we stole the trademark from DC. <laughs> In the in the original one, it was uh, it was Car it was Julie Schwartz editing, I believe, and Carmine drawing the cover, and um, because that was the thing, DC had this great thing where they would just anytime they thought they needed a bump in sales, they'd be like, "I got a gorilla idea." A gorilla idea. Well, you know, what's his name? The publisher, um, um, um the son of the founder, Donenfeld, uh, Erwin Erwin Donenfeld. I think they had a book. You know, where they kept track of what the sales of the various yeah. covers were. And as Tom was saying, if you had a gorilla on the cover or a purple background, um, and, I, and I think sometimes if somebody, some, somehow if somebody had their brain transferred into, <laughs> into a like, jar, it, yes, not into it, if they, if it was like a, a human but in a zoo and, and, uh, and desperate to get out, somehow that I think would would excite a lot of empathy in the readership as, as well. I, I, I talked, I'll name drop for a second. I talked to Levitz a long time ago about stuff and he had, he had essentially a book of sales figures like from the beginning of time. Right. And he would, he would, he would, he would essentially prove those things. If you do X, then newsstand sales would go up X percent. If you do Y, they go up. And if you, if you do Z, then they go down 15%. So we don't ever do Z. But the question is, so then why not have a gorilla on every cover? I guess that would be. Yeah, they, it would wear out. And why not have a gorilla star? Because the gorilla starring books like Angel and the Ape never did well enough to keep going. Uh, yeah. That's a, well, I was, you know, as a kid, I loved Con Gorilla. That was. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. That, that had all of those. Th I don't know if it had purple, but it had a guy who could switch brains with a gorilla. I mean, with a, yes. with a golden gorilla. Every, every kid's dream. <laughs> you know, it kinda, it, something about it, it although he never got he never got his own magazine con gorilla just was always a backup feature but right it was often the better feature what was it, an adventure comics or action it was one of one of those yeah it was, it's, adventure yeah, well it's no space cabby or uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh we've already got a couple comments here Madis network says hey yo what is up pops uh, thanks for stopping by. Uh, Rob Davis is in the house. Rob Davis says this Missourian is watching Silver Sunday and not the Chiefs and Taylor Swift. And what are they playing against? Uh, I think he means in whatever team they're playing against. I, I don't really know who's playing, to be honest with you. Um, I do know that there have been some funny memes going around, uh, obviously this week with all the whole uh, halftime stuff. I saw someone post, um, uh, we're now Yankovic and said, uh, this is the halftime show we really want to see. And I'm like, okay, I've watched that. <laughs> did he ever, did he ever, 
They never had him on halftime, did they? I don't yeah. think so. Not, no, not no. That I'm aware he's of. Too, no. He's too funny, Danny, and everybody he's knows that. Yeah, he's too silly. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Never have, they, they never have stand up comics at, uh, at the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. And they, they're in Vegas this year, which is the, the, the paradise of stand up <laughs> comedians. <laughs> and, oh, so I imagine they're going to have a big tribute to um, Shaky Green, who just died, right? That'll probably, that'll probably be the main event at halftime. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 I think so too. They're going <laughs> to. They're going to oh, roll out the hologram Shecky Green, and he's going to tell us. <laughs> uh, of course, we can always depend on Mr. David A. Scuterez. It says NFL Super Pro and Kickers Incorporated show how well comics and football mix. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are both uh, – those are shooters books, right? The new universe. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Tom and Tom, the, the award-winning Spider-Man team, uh, the Falco and Friends, did um, Kickers, Inc. And um, – and who did? Well, I guess Fabian did Super. Fabian, Pro. Fabian was the writer yeah, on yeah, yeah. Super. Pro. Yeah. I don't know who the I don't remember who the artist was. Um, maybe it, maybe it was rotating artists. I don't know. But I think it, it's, it's proof that when you're a freelancer, a job sometimes is is a job. A job you know, is a job. That's right. I think showing sports and comics is almost as hard as showing music and comics or dancing. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, somehow speaking of Carmine, I just. I just remember some comic, or of course, as the as the person who's written more issues of the Dazzler than any human living or dead, I can see, that, you know, trying to ex trying to convey music or just have people, you know, they would always, just every, you know, you could have like whatever Martha Graham dance troupe and they'd still look ridiculous and, and right, like, yeah. you know, yeah. have people dancing, you know. But well, that's because yeah. the you know the Jack Kirby ballet comic never really took off. <laughs> 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 or uh, or uh, oh, oh shoot, what's the guy who uh, I can't think of his name right now? Who all of his characters looked like they were dancing. They were they were doing ballet. Uh, did the Invaders? Um, oh, Frank Robbins. Frank Robbins. Yeah, they all look like they're prancing around and dancing, right? <laughs> it, was, it was. Yeah, I just never seen anybody convey dancing or you know and and or foot. You know, I, I think Julie had the right idea with strange sports stories. You inject, or, you know, yeah. some of the third science fiction element, and then right. and you mix it up. You don't have it be one sport. You know, it's like three right. different sports. You know, but it goes back. I, I was just looking at the Michael Vassallo was just posting. Uh, Doc V, as some of you may know, was just posting. He, he he is the world's foremost authority and probably is the world's greatest collection of Martin Goodman published magazines. Every, you know, everything not the comic books, all the weird and bizarre pulp magazines and right. and anthologies and and, and he uh, i guess he just is filling in his collection and just has like a some pulp magazines from the 30s you know sports oriented you know but but they they don't it's not like football magazine it's it's like 10 different sports from bowling to right. hockey to baseball to you know so yeah I think we're, we're going to get every reader all at once I'm yeah, right. Yeah. If you like bowling, we got a story for you. If you like basketball, we got a story for you. Well, that sounds like a lot what a lot of manga does, right? Yeah, but they of... but they keep it in separate volumes. This was uh, this was all in one volume. Yeah. Well, that would be, that would be a challenge to write a compelling bowling yeah. story, you know. That would be <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the people that make the story, Danny, not the ball. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a human story. Which bowling ball is really a time bomb? You know? That's right. <laughs> that's right. See now that I would that that sounds like a Julie Schwartz Carmine story. Right. Which bowling ball has the finger holes with the uh, flesh eating bacteria? That's <laughs> oh no, a spare. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so tonight's, of doom. so tonight, yeah. So tonight's all about you, uh, Danny. So. I'm I'm always going to start the questions and let these guys think about what they uh, what okay. they want if they don't already have their questions uh, ready. But uh, I'm just going to kind of go back to the beginning. We're going to uh, we're going to find out Danny Fingerell's origin. Um, tell us if you don't mind where you're from and uh, what your first introductions to comic books were. I am from a small island off the northeast coast of the United States, uh, Manhattan Island. Um, <laughs> yeah. that's a tiny one. Founded on all sides by water, very rarely 
are able to get off to the mainland, you know, the Bronx. I don't, I don't think there's any way to get off. You, you're you're <laughs> you still there. Everything, well, I'm still there, exactly. I'm born, I'm born raised, and, and live in Manhattan, which, as I say, makes me the most provincial person you will ever meet. Uh, <laughs> but that's where I'm from. Um, you know, this is a question I get a lot. What's my first comic? I was a big fan of Popeye the Sailor cartoons. I guess okay. that was in the repertoire of uh, Baby Boom, um, local New York um, TV stations. And so I love Popeye. And so my parents would buy me Popeye comic books. That, that's, ah. my, that's my first memory. And then um, my cousin, Steve Pizer, who if you're from the Providence area, you might have had some gum surgery done by him. But otherwise, um, <laughs> otherwise you probably wouldn't know. But, I, you know, I, I always am sure to to mention my cousin Steve was a, a comic fan. I remember him, uh, I guess once he knew I liked them, giving me a lot of comics. I remember an adventure comic uh, starring Superboy where he had lost the ability to fly and he was inside of a box kite that his, <laughs> that his father was somehow, somehow they thought that they could fool people that if they put him in the kite, <laughs> would, no one would know that he had lost the ability to fly. Uh, so that, oh, that Jonathan Kent. So that was the beginning. You know, that was the beginning. I mean, so it was, uh, it was the, it was the, uh, the prime uh, DC Silver Age stuff. You know, the yeah. Julie Schwartz and Mort Weisinger, the Mort Weisinger Superman, the Julie Schwartz Flash. Um, and 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 I remember buying Sad Sack comics. Mm. Um, but I didn't. I I, I was not into. The, my main genre was superheroes, unsurprisingly, and I would buy humor comics, Popeye and Sad Sack, but I was never particularly interested in Western comics or science fiction. Something about the superhero fantasy really appealed to me, and I was there. I did not have Fantastic Four number one. Okay. I had Fantastic Four number two, which I bought at a used magazine store for five cents because it was used. So... <laughs> Who would pay full ten cent price for it? Other people, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I, I was. I was Somebody in the, probably wrote their name on the cover of it too. Right. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. I think they probably knew they were going to flip it, you know, and, and just take a fifty percent <laughs> loss. Um, so I was very early, very early in the Marvel uh, revolution, and I was the perfect age. And so, if I was like eight or nine, I've been reading comics since I was five. And I've been reading comics almost half my life. Yeah, I was totally jaded, and this Marvel thing came along. You know, I mean, unless you, you know, I think some of you were there. You know, but unless you were there, it's hard to describe what an impact yeah. those those comics had. Right. Yeah. So, so, so go ahead, Tom. So, if you've been how how are you able how are you able to afford to live in Manhattan then? Are you, are you in a, are you in a rent controlled $20 a month apartment that dates back to the fifties? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> that is exactly two he lives yes, on the street. Was, is, I, trying to say. Yes. My, my mother moved into the apartment I grew up in in 1940 and she moved out feet first in 2010. So somewhere in that period mm -hmm. I was born. So you are exact, Tom. You know your New York real estate. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because if you if you if you left New York, you could never get back in at the current prices, right? <laughs> uh, you know there are ways to do it because I have I do not live in the apartment I grew up in, so I've I've I've, I've uh, had some real estate adventures, um, and I kind of. Yeah, I don't need. I don't need to go into detail, but you know, yes, <laughs> he doesn't want to tell you. I, I got it. it. Just, but yes, you're, I know a guy. Let me put it. Yeah, um, I'm as close to New Jersey as you can get without being in New Jersey. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so, you know, so are I, you saying when the wind blows the right direction? <laughs> I'll be in New Jersey. You can, you, yes, you can. The, the Jersey, you can smell Jersey from. <laughs> Yeah, listen. Um, I'm in no, Canada. I can smell Jersey from here. Right. Also, the other thing, Tom, is that yes, it, we. So you you did hit the nail on the head. I did grow up in a rent control apartment, but in the late '60s, you know, in the '60s and '70s, none of my suburban relatives were jealous that my family lived in Manhattan. You know, this is this was this is not the Manhattan that you, you know that you may know from being a tourist or even living there in recent years. This was this was sort of New York. On the decline, you know, right. um, 
So, uh, and you know, so, and I mean, even as a as a young adult, I, you know, I was able. They were they were still up until maybe 1980. There were, if you were willing, you know, even if you didn't have a rent controlled or rent stabilized apartment, there were still trade offs you could make. You could live right. in in a really crappy building, or you know, you know. Now I, I don't think there's anything in Manhattan um, that's really like that. But but you know, in my in my young adulthood, there there were still deals to be had if you're willing to sacrifice. Um, you know, water. If, water. If, if you're willing to, if you're willing to have a bathtub in your kitchen. Um, unlike, and, unlike your, uh, your relatives, I, uh, I I'm very jealous that you live in Manhattan. So. You know, it's it's ironic that I do because I, as a kid, you know, what you want as a kid is to get out of your hometown, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah. so my hometown happened to be Manhattan. So as a as a kid and a, and a young adult, you know, the you know, I, you know, my one requirement for college was that it not be in New York City. You know, that was <laughs> I had a very low bar for where I go. It was like, you know, it just has Anywhere. to be. Manhattan. <laughs> you know, whereas whereas other people go, well, my one recovering college is is that a B in New York? Mine, I just can't do that. You know, right. <laughs> so it's it's it, you know, and then and then you know, like like people do, you know, I graduated college. Um, I had a a filmmaking degree from um, the State University of New York in Binghamton, which is four hours away. It's it's. Um, Midway between New York and Buffalo, I guess is. But you're on the train line. No, no, no. Binghamton, uh, Binghamton was not on the train. They, they stopped. You know, the, it was on the bus. I, it was on actually many episodes of Twilight Zone <laughs> place at the Binghamton bus station because Rod <laughs> Serling was from Binghamton. Okay. <laughs> so he's probably the most famous person from Binghamton. <laughs> um so, so, so when you went to college, in you, you didn't go to college with the idea of of work, working in comics. You went to college with the idea of, of becoming a filmmaker. Then, yeah, working in film, or you know, um, you know, to give me credit for having an idea or a goal. With, you know, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that that assumption, and I won't contradict it. Um, <laughs> no, I love comics. You know, but. And again, this may be familiar to some of you. I I reached the age where people outgrow, you know, comics mm. at the same time that Jack Kirby left Marvel. You know, mm. so I'm not sure. There's, there was a certain feeling I had that. that okay, they, I'm done. Like, well, that I don't know if it was me or them. You know, yeah. but because I look at stuff when I when I was a teenager, I was, you know. Um, I was on the um, literary magazine in my high school. I know you'd be shocked uh, <laughs> uh, about that. And, and, and um, you know, I developed other interests, underground comics and movies. Mm -hmm. But it seemed to me that the comics, that Marvel was no longer fresh and had lapsed into formula. You know, when I look at those comics years later, I go, well, they're very professionally done. Right. And certainly highly competent, talented people. But it, they had lapsed into formula, you know, not unlike the Marvel movies and TV shows now, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but I mean, so that happened simultaneously. Um, and, and, um, and I guess in a way the Manhattan thing, so I, I got green filmmaking came back home like you do after college, which was Manhattan. Oh, what do I want to do? I don't have a clue. I mean, <laughs> I, had some, I had some ideas, um, but I thought, gee, it might be fun to work at Marvel comics. <laughs> and, the entire, and the entire investment was a subway token you know it was like you know and i i you know i knew i you know i knew somebody who knew somebody who could get me in there on an informational tour and that's what wow. i did and, and that led to me getting uh a job that was interesting is that I didn't say, gee, it might be fun to work at DC Comics. That, even though that would have been the same subway token, it never right. occurred to me. <laughs> yeah. You could have done both tours the same day. <laughs> well, you know, as as someone who remembers the comics during those, those periods, uh, you know, DC just wasn't exciting. Uh, and I know Mike, Mike might want to uh, throw hands with me there, but you know, I remember looking at them and going, you know, 
I had friends who read some Batman and some Superman, but I'm like, yeah, th those are just not exciting to me. You but didn't, I, I didn't see the gorillas. <laughs> but I had really I missed the gorillas, yeah. <laughs> well, but, uh, but Marvel then had the uh, the super apes. You know, that was uh, the great. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. Were, what an insane! What, a, what an insane! I. Yeah, but you're also, kidding. Also, there was a big ape on one of the, uh, 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 I think just before Neil Adams did the Avengers, around issue 92, 93, something like that. Was it one of their big ape uh, when they went to the, the Savage Land? Well, look, when you think about it, there's not that big a, uh, if you squint and you look at Tongarilla and you look at the thing, <laughs> they're kind of the same silhouette, right? I mean, <laughs> big, big orange character. So, so I mean, it's funny. It's fun. Again, I've done similar interviews and, and and I think it's been it's been useful or interesting I think what I tended to do in my life was aim myself in a general direction so it's like all right I know I knew since I was you know very young that I was going to try to do something creative, -y, creative. You know, something that that involved making stuff and you know, and, 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 and it would be visual, you know, and, and it would, have word, it would have words and images, you know. So, you know, obviously at Marvel, I met people who from the time they were, you know, five years old knew they wanted to work in the comic book business. Certainly when I was a kid, I wanted to be Jack Kirby because yeah. if you're a comic fan, what else would you want to be? Right. right. You know, I mean, he, even even as 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 interesting and personable a figure as Stanley made of made the Stanley that Stanley invented for the comics was was a was somebody I enjoyed reading about, but the mm. you know and reading what he wrote, but the guy who drew it was always sort of the, so that so that was that was an early ambition, and I drew as a kid. I drew all the time. Um, one of the great. You know, this, this may this this, this may um, tie into you know my attention span issues, but when I was a kid, I took the famous artist co uh, test on the back of the comics. Right. <laughs> yeah. Rob Binky. Believe, oh, party, it, wasn't it? I, believe it or not, I passed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sh I'm shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> and, and they sent a salesman to the to, to our apartment, and the guy. Now, of course, once again. I lived probably within walking distance of half a dozen world class art schools, right. but it's like no, I'm I'm going to have this guy from the famous artist school come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try for the one in the comic books. <laughs> what is and, the, what is the and, famous one? Well, right there, it's famous in the name. So, um, so my parents said, you know, the guy did the pitch and. Uh, and my parents said to me, well, look, I think it was like a Friday or Thursday. I said, think, my, my parents said, think about it over the weekend. And if you still want it Monday, we will, we will let you enroll in the course. Well, you know, by Monday, my attention was, you know, <laughs> somehow my focus had been lost, but, I, but I mean, it, so, so maybe it wasn't as direct a path as, as some uh, uh, other people, but, but, you know, and then, and, and then I was very interested in underground comics. I was especially especially interested in Harvey Picar's work. Mm. You know, that was that kind of, you know, he took a little piece of like what Crumb did and made it into like a whole genre of, right. uh, uh, of autobiographical and memoir and comics. So, so I was kind of after several years of not being so much into comics, you know, and, and the more, and, and so, and, and so I went to, I went to, I went on the tour of Marvel and that led to me, I think like six months later, getting my, my first uh, job in comics, I was um, Larry Lieber's assistant in the British department, which was- a, oh, That, that which, seems to be the entry point for a number of people. Well, it was a, it was a good, you know, it was, it was this offbeat thing where Marvel, sometimes, I sometimes think it's just because Stan's wife was British, because otherwise I don't know why, <laughs> you know, but there was there was a weekly British comic market. 2000 AD was the most popular thing they did, but Bino, right? Um, and so somehow Marvel, it, it, probably in the early 70s, because it was in place, right? But Tony Isabella, Scott Edelman, uh, yeah. a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people, um, 
went through there. But Larry had just come back from um, uh, Seaboard, Atlas Seaboard. Right. The Mar that was Martin Goodman's uh, spike company that he hired, uh, you know, the, he hired one of the Lieber brothers. You know, Stan was not available. So, um, next best thing. All right. I got Larry, who I'm still in touch with to this day, actually, you know. Um, and um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But anyway, so Larry, um, I think there were some insiders who wanted the job, but um, this is always my advice for job seekers, which is when you go for your job interview, make sure you have masking tape, not just on one side of your glasses, but on both sides. <laughs> of your glasses. Because uh, that must have done the trick. We had about a five minute interview. Larry hired me and, you know, uh, this, this was the summer of Sam, you know, the, the blackout, the summer of Sam. Um, um, so that July I started working, um, in the British, so the British department was mostly a reprint department. We would take the mm -hmm. American comics, we would um, split like a 17-page comic into three six-page chapters with new splash pages, and and they, and they'd be uh, every other, you know sometimes new covers, and uh, and Captain Britain was the only thing that was consistently new material. Right. And so it was a good way to break in. It was you know it, it mostly was a reprint. It was a good way for me to catch up. On all those years of comics I'd missed by reading, yeah, you know, to have to split them up into chapters. So that was, you know, but even though we were in the offices, I don't think people really took the British department that seriously. Even though a lot of people went from it to the mainstream, uh, and oddly enough, we did start. It was just seventy-seven was the summer of Star Wars, yeah, and Star Wars we were reprinting at a faster rate in England than. They were printing them in America, um, so I ended up being the de facto assistant editor on Star Wars as well, assisting Archie Goodwin uh, on Star Wars because we were we were putting out the equivalent of two issues a month in in England because it was so popular there. So that that was and that was the period when you know I got to work. You know I I was blissfully unaware of a lot of the comic business uh, politics and huh. and 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 history. I kind of knew the history of my childhood. I knew a little bit of stuff, but I was really pretty ignorant. So, you know, so they would say, well, Carmine Infantino was working for us now, and, and he's going to, you'll work with him on new covers and splash pages. And I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, were, you know, but I didn't, you know, I, had, I didn't know about, you know, all the ugliness that happened with him at, at, at DC and why he was yeah. at Marvel in the first place. I was just sort of, I was starstruck enough to be going, holy crap, I'm, I'm like telling Carmine Infantino to do stuff, and he's doing it. Right. <laughs> so you were, you know, right. you were starting. You were starting in the business at the same time. A lot of the older generation were sort of still there, but transitioning out, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it took them another five or ten. You know, you're right. right. I, right people, I was working with Mike Esposito, Carmine Infantino, Frank Giacoya, um, uh, um, um, uh, John Tartag, um, and of course Stan and uh, Larry. Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was, but it was weird because they didn't see themselves as stars, you know, because right. comics was still this second class business then. A disposable so we, medium, right? Right. Disposable medium. I mean, it was really weird, you know, when you think. You know, because to me they were stars, because they were the names from my childhood. But they right, were right. Credits, but they were, they were just, you know, they were just getting people. They, well, they were just people. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, that that is that, yes. Most of them were very nice and couldn't have been more accepting and more friendly. That definitely. But when I think of how they were treated and how they were, how badly mm. they were paid, and oh my, you know, if I was. It, yeah, it 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 boggles the the mind that you know, especially when you like when you see their names now in in in, right. you know, in, in the movies. Yeah. And, and but they came from that from that era. Yeah. You know when, I mean, some of them still came in. Well, George Russo was on staff, but they would come in. They would come in dressed in suits and ties. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you go and you think, well, gee, this is. Isn't the point of being in a business like this that you can come out? Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they I don't live, want a tie. 
they live in the suburbs and all their neighbors are going in, you know, into the city to be accountants and lawyers. And, and they sort of, there was definitely that, that thing that, you know, where Stan would, you know, and other people would tell those stories about, they'd be at a cocktail party yeah. and, you know, what do you do? And then, you know, they would try, oh, I work in publishing. Oh, in magazines, yeah. You know, <laughs> they would try to avoid as much as they can saying they worked in comic books. Right. Know? Yeah. Now, now, now it's like a thing. It's like, yeah, I work in comics. I, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, a graphic, like, oh, I'm, a cool. graphic, I'm a graphic novelist. I'm a, That's you know, right. you know, there is, I mean, it's funny. There is still, especially, you know, if you, you know, look, there's a certain level on which my extended family still thinks it's cute that I, yeah. that I work in comics. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, but there's, but there's yeah. another, yeah. but there's also a level on which a lot of people think, especially say I worked on Spider-Man. Hey, they think, even, you know, even a simple, you know, amount of thought. They think that somehow I created Spider-Man. No, I didn't. <laughs> and, then, and then they're sure because I just even touched Spider-Man, I must be insanely wealthy. Right, of course. <laughs> yeah. And right. of course, now your name is in the credits in the, in the movies now, right? I have not had my name in single credit. Wait, really? no, I thought I saw your name on one of the on really one of them. I thought so. Uh oh, now we're gonna go. It's a, now the flurry of internet people is gonna go have to look it up. I, I don't know. I I, I I thought I saw. You know, at the end, there's like special yeah, yeah, things. Know, they they list about fifteen and people. And that guy, Danny, is that? What yeah, no, I, I I as far. I mean, look, I have not seen everything, so as far. It, I don't. I, I'm not. Don't. I'm not gonna swear yeah. to it. Uh, so when, well, when the Dark Hawk movie comes out, you get the. Uh, oh, but I didn't create. You know, it was it was DeFalco and Manley. I wrote every issue and every annual, and I, I certainly am heavily identified. I thought you created it. No, I. I Tom did um, did like a, a very like a short um, bible for the character, maybe a ten five or ten page document. But right. I saw so a lot of what you think of as Dark Hawk. I did add to it and 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 right. um, embellish it, but the. Creators of record are, are, are DeFalco and Manley. And wow. and Dazzler, no, I didn't yeah, that's but what I I mean look, I've certainly seen a lot of stories or elements of stories that I've worked on as writer or editor yeah. in, you know, as plot points in movies. Yep. You know, and uh yeah, but I've well I mean it's funny, like for years for years, you know, Literally 20 years ago, then my book Superman, Superman on the Couch came out, which was my first, you know, kind of book about pop culture. And starting then, I must have been in a dozen DC comic movies, you know, documentary. Mm -hmm. I've been a talking head in a lot of documentaries, but I, you know, and, and, and DVD extras, but I don't know if I've ever been. I did work on. Um, a consultant, a consultant curator on that Marvel Universe of Superheroes traveling exhibition that's been all over the country. Mm. Oh yeah. So I worked on that, and we um, we we shot uh, a lot of footage for a documentary, but the, it never it hasn't been finished yet. So maybe then, but but I'm maybe because I wrote a book called Superman on the Couch, another called Disguised as Clark Kent. But I I've, I've been at a ton of DC documentaries, but I don't know if I've been in any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, your, there's your next book my friend you need a, you need a, <laughs> yeah. you need a marvel hardcover I, I, I think so right well you know that uh, maybe the stan lee book although although just although actually the stan lee book is not authorized by stan his family marvel or their lawyer you know it's, it's, a, completely, <laughs> it's a completely independent book and i mean i mean and i want it that way you know um, yeah reason. got a couple comments here phil leon says hey yo silver line crew what is up phil and uh, Gray Wolf Graphics says, hiya, chat. What's up, Gray Wolf? Thank you guys for uh, stopping in. If you got questions for uh, <laughs> Mr. Danny Fingeroth, uh, do not hesitate to leave them. <laughs> we got a bunch of them, but if you've got some, don't uh, don't hesitate. Uh, so so how did you get then from um, from the, the British department then into editing Spider-Man? Which is which is I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's probably what most people Right. Uh, remember yeah. you for at Marvel is is, is all those uh, all those cool Spider Man stories. I did the Brit work in the British department um, um, until a guy named Des Skin, British publisher. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. the Warrior guy. Yeah, well before he's the Warrior guy, he was the publisher of the British Mad magazine. Des Skin 
came to Marvel with this with this wild proposition. He said, you know, maybe maybe people from the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens should not be the ones doing the British books. Maybe actual British people should be doing the British books. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, Marvel saw the wisdom in that. <laughs> so um, so the, they gave me Sal Brodsky, who was sort of the over, Larry was my boss, and Sal was sort of the, the head of all kinds of special projects. And Sal said to me, Danny, tell me when we should uh, disband the department. When when we, when should we fire everybody? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Danny, you're the newest one here. When should we? Uh, when should we so I, I did what I did. What he probably knew I would do, which was the idea. You know, I padded it a little. I added a few weeks to keep people employed as long as I could. But so, but but after about a year and a half, that that happened, and so Larry was. At that point, was doing the uh, was drawing and I think writing the Hulk newspaper strip. Um, So, although he and I still stayed in the same room, uh, the same uh, same windowless room at Marvel, until I saw a room with a window, and then I ran. I I grabbed it for him (laughs) and me. But um, so Larry, and then I became a shared assistant. They kept me on what I call the Danny Finger Oath Memorial job. They, they, <laughs> they kept me on as a shared assistant between Sal Brodsky and Jim Shooter, um, which was interesting because uh, they were not best friends. You know, they, oh. um, they, uh, the they had divergent agendas and I was in the middle. So that was an interesting um, place to be. So I did. But I, st- but then I still uh, was because um, we were still supplying, and I was the British liaison. So <laughs> it, it, mainly that was Star Wars because they we were still producing the stuff. So I became the assistant editor on Star Wars, and then um, so that lasted about a year, um, and then they uh, uh, Jim expanded the editorial line. He hired Louise Simonson. Who was then Louise Jones from uh, Warren Comics? Right, and he just like assigned me to be her assistant. I mean that you know, and luckily we got along really well, you know. But um, but so and so so that is what. So I sort of got into the oh, and then while I in that interim year, I think I think Marvel must have they must have had some arrangement with advertisers that they would have their ads printed in a minimum number of comics per month right yeah. oh and so we had a they had a quick that's when they added that reprint line of like half a dozen fantasy masterpieces tales to astonish yeah. so i was the editor of those re of those reprint books so i so if you have those and you wince at the couple of pages we had to cut out because the the page count was down to seven i'm i'm the one to blame for <laughs> and then and I think then, I spotted some of those in uh, Marvel Super Action. Right, uh, Marvel. Yeah, yeah. Um, we read the Avengers. So yeah, you know, so there was a lot of different. You know, there's always a lot of different uh, kind of editorial related jobs to do. So uh, until I and then, and then I became Louise's assistant on the on, on an insane number of books. You know, we had the X Men books and the Conan books and. Um, uh, Battlestar Galactica and Micronauts, um, and, and a bunch of special, you know, movie projects. So that, but that, so that was my shift into mainstream editorial uh, as Louise's assistant. And then, at a certain point in the rotation, I think Tom DeFalco was promoted to be executive editor, and he had, he had been the one, I guess, he and Jim, who for the first time had all the Spider-Man books with one editor. Up to then, they'd just been scattered. Right, uh, you know, uh, among different editors, <laughs> uh, you know, but but Shooter, I think, was kind of in a way emulating what had been the DC system, although even the, you know, where each character, I don't even know if DC did that. It's, anyway, each character family they, did, they, they moved them over eventually so that they became a they were a group. So there was a yeah. Superman group right. editor and a Batman group editor, but that wasn't and then was miscellaneous yeah. second tier superhero editor. But, but even they weren't, you know, I mean, they had, they had the editorial families, but they didn't, you know, but they were more about the personalities of the, 
of the editors and who their favorite freelancers were as opposed to yes. the yeah. characters, God forbid. Correct. So, so under under Tom, it had started where they actually had all the Spider-Man related titles under one editor. And so um, I think I was kind of in line to be promoted and and the Spider-Man books came open and that that was the beginning of my relationship uh, with Spider-Man. Wow. Now, how long were you a uh, Spider-Man editor? There were, two fa- there were two phases. Okay. I did it for about a year and a half in, okay. in, in, in the eighties. Then I went uh, freelance. I was a contract freelancer for several years. And I thought, well, I will never see those Spider-Man books again. You know, I, I wanted to try. I wanted to see what being a freelancer would be like. Um, it was interesting, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, but I, um, I, I thought I will, especially just as I left. You know, is when they started giving editorial royalties. So I thought, well, this is Spider-Man. I will never see this again. But the, and then I came back on staff in '89. Um, and you know, which I, I think that was when Carl Potts was promoted to an executive editor position. So I got uh, Alpha Flight, Cloak and Dagger, Moon Knight, a um, couple of other um, books like that. And then one day, and again, I just thought, well, you know, I'd walked away from Spider Man. I'll never see those books again. And then I remember I was having like a, a you know, I was having an argument with Tom about something. You know, we'd just been having this ongoing argument all day. You know, and uh, not you, Tom, but Tom DeFalco. <laughs> Tom DeFalco. And, <laughs> and, and he calls me into his office, you know, like late in the day. And I think, well, he just, he just wants to continue this argument and whatever, you know. And I said, yeah, what? And he said, I got, I got three new assignments for you. I go, what? He goes, Amazing Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Web of Spider-Man. I go, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, you know, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so I got them. I got the books uh, back, and eventually, I got the book. The the book that we in the office we called the adjectiveless Spider Man, which was the Todd McFarlane book, right? right. Um, and and uh, and then that grew. You know, it was during that big boom of the later of the early nineties, and so then it became the Spider Man group, and I had editors uh, that reported to me, and it and. Uh, you know, and so and so I was there. That was from like nine, ninety, the very beginning of ninety one until I left in ninety five. You know, and that. Um, so yeah, you know, but but uh, you know, a lot of people, and no reason, you know, since they're not me, they just look at it as one continuum. But they were right you know, one freelance. But I, you know, and uh, it's funny because um, you know, again, Tom is is one of my best friends uh, to this day. The other Tom. Tom DeFalco. <laughs> and, you're, and you're nice too, Tom. <laughs> Listen, my feelings aren't hurt. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but that one, you know, you know, it, it, you know, he ran an office where you could argue with the boss, you know, yeah, and, and right. uh, you know, it was just fun. It was just fun because I just remember that day. It's like, oh, what, what does he want now? You know. <laughs> so, he, so what is? What is an editor of Spider-Man's family titles? What does that look like? What do you do? Um, because we have we have an understanding of what an editor does, but what is a Spider-Man editor at Marvel with a group of titles? What does that look like? Well, you got this one character, um, but he has to carry, um, you know. Well, again, at its peak, we were putting out, I think, seventeen Spider-Man related titles every month. In other words, miniseries, <sighs> annual specials. Right. Oh my gosh! You know, so there are the four core, you know, it's amazing, spectacular. At that point, it's amazing, spectacular, web, web, which I came up with the name for. Thank you very much. Excellent, it's a great Spider-Man. name. Spider Man, and um, and then actually, you know, the, the Spider Man, right? So you, you know, you want, how do you, you want to subtly, it's the same guy. And everything's happening in the same timeline. Right. So sometimes you want to cross over between all four titles, which is challenging in its own way, especially if you're dealing with four different writers. You need to find where things happened and where the characterizations are consistent and 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 where he's not 
you know, you're not always going to succeed, but you don't want him trapped by Dr. Octopus, you know, one week, and then the next week he's on a date with Mary Jane or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, right. You know, it's an, an it's inevitable that, that things will happen where you can't get it perfectly. You know, you want to have it both ways. You want to have it be a seamless story, uh, you know, and yes, you kind of subtly want to get people to buy all four of the all months, books. all four of the core right. titles, but you also know that because it's a legacy title, that more people are going to be buying Amazing than will be buying the other titles. Right. Um, but yeah, you try you try to maintain a consistency, and then if you are working with four writers, then you have to, you know, how to how to. You know whether it's one continued story or four separate storylines. How do you keep the um, everything? How do you keep all the plates spinning and and the yeah. characterization consistent right. and the relationships consistent? So that's um, and then and then because it's Spider-Man, you're also reading you know um, animation scripts and you're also reading any mm. guest star scripts that he's in right. uh, in other people's comics. Um, so a lot of it is a lot of it, you know. So a lot of it is is basic editorial, which is just playing, you know, um, policeman, policeman. Well, father, mother, policeman, psychiatrist, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you, priest, you, you know, anything. Psychologist. You yeah. Do you take pitches? Would you take pitches from the writers, or do you develop core ideas in the office and help the writers out? Ooh, that's a good question. You've read a comic or two in your time. Hey, right? you know, I've uh, I've worked with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. It's yeah. both. You know, I mean, my threat always was, if you guys don't come up with good stories, you have to go with my shitty stories. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I always tried to go. I was, I always went into a meeting with a fallback idea, mm, you right? Know, just uh, in in case, and um, boy, oh boy, that. But that's a I, I would say the quest, the the plot line. I came in with that round robin storyline, which had uh, Moon Knight in it because I've been editing Moon Knight and right. I'm out, you know, and that we needed like a summer. You know, the, the, uh, Spider Man, Amazing Spider Man, came out every two weeks in the summer, so I, we needed something. And then I just this. Let's do this. We we'll have a lot of guest stars, of the Punisher and Moon Knight and twelve other. And I called it Round Robin because it was a subtle, because um, because I think Robin the Ro the Robin miniseries was very popular at the time over at DC, so I called it yeah. Round Robin, you know? <laughs> and it was sort of uh, circular. And then the other one that uh, that not all the writers loved was I I I was the one who came up with bringing back uh, Peter Parker's parents. Mm. You know, and 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 making that storyline where it wasn't really their parents. Spoiler alert for a thirty-year-old story. So, you know, <laughs> right. yeah. but you know, here it, it seems like, and again, I'm looking at it from a perspective of of an office worker as opposed sure. to a freelancer. But if you're if you're if you have to come up with you know five hundred Spider-Man stories, pretty much you're going to get to everything. Like yeah. you're, you're, including you're going to bring in aliens, you're going to bring back their parents, you're going to bring back the scrolls, you're going to bring back you know whoever. Well, A, you're right. B, of course, in the modern era where writers are very conscious of not giving away their best, what they think are their best ideas. Right. You know, in a work for hire situation. Yeah. And, but you know, look, the thing about Spider Man and about the Marvel Universe in general is that the characters and storylines generate other characters and storylines. That's part of the appeal. Yeah. It's, but but you're right. You know, I, somehow I got them. I just thought, you know, just having kept up with Spider-Man since I would, since my first go round as editor. And I just thought, you know, nobody's done anything with the parents since that annual. And I get why, because it was, you know, it, it was, it seemed even to, even as a kid, I have to say, it seemed kind of like, okay, if Peter is supposed to be this every man and now you're telling me his parents are James Bond, you know, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mrs. James Bond, it just seemed like, you know, but I mean, there it was, we had it and it, and it, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, was going through my mind in my, you know, personal life as well as my reading life was just like, wow, here's this guy who's been an orphan from the first day we meet him with this. And he's full, I mean, 
you know, I mean, literally his origin, which is the, 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 all the best origins, a trauma origin. So here's another right. trauma origin. <laughs> right. You know, his parental figure is killed. But what about his actual, uh, you know, anyway, the, so I, I say those are the two main ones that I kind of, um, you know, just kind of uh, exerted my editorial authority. And not every, you know, you maybe you've read interviews with one particular writer who uh, really hated the idea and had some very... Um, it's, it's the internet. Everybody hates everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, there you, go. Um, you know, um, but, but very often, I remember there was one... There was a story, I think uh, it was a vulture story that uh, J.M. DeMattis and Sal Buscema did. And um, and I think at the end of it, I mean, somehow there was a story where at the end of it, uh, Spider-Man, oh, it might have been um, one of Black Crow, was that a character, a, a, spider, a Native American character? Um, I, seem, I seem to recall that, yeah. Yeah. I think the Black Crow, somehow in that story, Spider Man got scratched with a poison claw by a by a crow. And somehow I just said to them, I said to them, Anna, or he said to me, one of us said, oh, mate, you know, that could, a whole other story could take off from there. So if you're lucky, if you're, if you're kind of cooking with your, right, uh, with your, with your writers and the artists, then, then the, then the ideas generate them. You know, if you, you know, Peter Parker is a very relatable character. So yeah. somehow, some ideas, you know, um, yeah, that, the ideas come. But you're right. At a certain point, right, everything's been done. Um, right. Well, you start, uh, you, you start to feel like Roy Thomas going back through the All-Star Squad comics to find out what the characters did on a Tuesday that was never addressed. <laughs> well, the, problem, uh, the difference is, I think, that, you know, when Roy... When Roy in the 60s or 70s would go back to a story from the 40s, the odds are he was the only one who would remember that story. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, with, uh, but with the, it, since the advent of the Marvel Age, any story was somebody, was, there would be a large, well, large part right. of the audience that would. And as evidence, history. Mr. David Ace Gutierrez said uh, he thinks that might have been Puma, who you're talking about, the story. Um, no, I, I think it no? was. It, you know, I, I have not looked at the story for about 25 years, but I think so. It could be, but I just remember a crow, you know, I, I, you know, I think you're right. I think Puma was in that storyline. I think that wasn't, was yeah. in that story. We, we've learned to rely on, uh, uh, on Mr. David Ace Gutierrez when he, yeah. uh, when he starts giving us facts. <laughs> I, I think Tom has before said it's time for the history checkers. <laughs> That's right. Cause it's, it, cause we're not, it, this may, this may surprise you, but we're not historians here on the show. And it's, uh, it's, we're, we're, we're hey, show. <laughs> and we're just we're just <laughs> so so before we uh move on to the next day tommy roberta mike y'all have any questions with the uh, um, uh, i'm just the enjoying this yeah yeah i've got i've got one i've got one all right fire away um how'd you involved with uh will Aster, uh like with the week and and the studio and and all that I, well, that's, a, that's a good that is a good question yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a big Oscar guy, and like I said, I've, I've enjoyed what you've done over the years for the week, and the, just in general with the with the conversations with you know well, thank other you. people. Well, I, can, I, 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 I have no, I have what promises to be an amazing um, Will Eisner week thing that I'm that I'm doing online. This this yeah, Will Eisner week is in March around what would have been Will's birthday on March sixth. Um, after um, after Marvel and after a few internet startups um, that I worked on, worked with and on, um, I was uh, once again uh, a freelancer. And, and one of the things I, I started doing was writing books um, and, um, and also putting out a magazine for tomorrow. It's called Right Now, called Danny Fingeros Right Now Magazine. Right. It, it worked for Kirk Music with Astro City. Why can't it work for? You, you got to put your name in it. That's, <laughs> That's it. it. I was building a brand. That's right. right. Yeah. I was. So, <laughs> um, so along the way, 
So I became, so that started my road of being a comics historian and pop culture critic and whatever the hell I am. Um, and so one thing I started doing was giving talks about um, hit comics history and figures in comics history. And one of them was um, about, I started talking about Eisner, you know, I, I giving PowerPoint talks about Eisner. Um, Oh, and you know, and I had met Jules Pfeiffer when I was researching um, this guy, this Clark Kent. So I knew Jules, and so it all started coming together. And then I guess the Carl and uh, Nancy Gropper, who run the Eisner Estate and the Eisner Foundation, they came to one of my talks. I, you know, I could be getting the exact details on but they came to one of my talks, which I think was a different one than the one when Pfeiffer came to one of my talks about Eisner, when... Um, when I started talking about the story 10 minutes, what's 10 minutes in a man's life? Oh yeah. And I'm blabbing away and pontificating and Jules raises his hand and he says, I wrote that story when I was 17. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I, said, I said, you know what? I'm going to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to let you stand up here because I would feel like a complete idiot wow. to say something about this story. But so, but I got I, so I got involved with comics history, comic studies, um, and this was just I think Will Eisner Week had been on for like a year. They had one or two venues in New York, and they said to me, you know, we want somebody to kind of run this will i think we can expand it um to expand you know you know i think partly to sell eisner graphic novels but i think more importantly to 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 maintain his legacy and to maintain um to, to grow the awareness of graphic novels you know don't be yeah. 50 years ago you know graphic novels weren't quite what they are today so you know right. Um, I mean, my so, class exists because of graphic not the term yeah, graphic novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that started it, and you know, just to pat myself on the back, you know, I helped them grow it from two events in New York to like over a hundred events worldwide, and including online. And then, and even during the COVID, we had you know you can still you can find the willisner dot com, all a lot of pre recorded uh, interviews and talks with people. So. So the mandate is it doesn't have to be specifically about Will Eisner. It could just be some graphic novel to topic to which you would append the Will Eisner, you know, mm. or the Will Eisner Week event. And, and we just have a – so what I'm doing uh, on March 5th, I was reading about a book um, by Nicholas Meyer who directed a bunch of Star Trek movies Yes, and wrote a bunch of um, – so was pastiches. Well, one of them was called The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. And it's a, you know, it's a debunking of the uh, horrific protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was right. a completely fraudulent anti-Semitic document. And, uh, and I'm reading a quote from Meyer, which he says something like, I didn't have the heart to really read you know, in detail, all the various editions of the protocols, but my research was greatly helped by Will Eisner's The Plot, the story of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So I thought, well, I wonder if I could ever get in touch with Nicholas Meyer and, uh, and maybe he'd want to do an event about Will Eisner and the plot. So through the miracle of the internet, I was able <laughs> to do that. And so on May 5th, on March fifth, I will be interviewing Nicholas Meyer. Yes, about, sweet. About yes. I have a feeling maybe some Star Trek related topics will come up. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think so. so. Yeah. So no, where can folks where can folks find that? Um, I will send you the information, but it it, it, it it's through Ben, it's through a guy named Ben Catcher, who is a oh yeah, uh, ground cartoonist, and he teaches at Parsons in New York, and this is. Um, this is maybe the best kept secret in comics. Every week, Ben runs something called the New York Comics and Pictures, New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. And it's mostly on since COVID, it's mostly online, but it, you know, up, up, up until COVID, it was in, in Manhattan at Parsons. Um, but it's just this incredible lineup of, of people 
mostly about comics and graphic novels. Some stuff that's yeah. that's not quite directly, but every every year he gives us a a slot to do a, 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 an Eisner week thing on Eisner week. Yeah, fair enough. And th and this year, so I'll be doing that. So it's a New York comic and picture. You know, Comics and Picture Story Symposium, but I, uh, uh, Rowland, I'll, I'll send okay. you the, uh, the link. Yeah, yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Stu, I'm a big, I'm a big Meyer fan. Okay, uh, well, good. You at the Q and A, you can ask him all the stuff that I'm. I'm <laughs> I'll ask him all the nerdy crap that will make him roll his eyes. <laughs> Not you again, kid. In, in <laughs> episode number thirteen, can you? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I read one of his non Sherlock Holmes novels, which I think is called Moving Target or something like that. When it before he became, you know, before he became Nicholas Meyer. Right. When he was just a when he when he was you know just a writer. Yeah. Um, I read I read his first novel, so I'm. Uh, I, should, I'm I should probably read that to prepare for this. Uh, I'm into <laughs> it. Top a, continue it, the cliff notes. It's a great sort of Washington D.C. You know, who can you trust thriller? And you you read it if you read it now, you'll look and go, well, this is you know a thousand movies that have been made since, but right. back then it was still it, it no. still seemed fresh. Yeah, and I'm and I'm reading his. He has a memoir called The View from the Bridge. Not to, oh, be confused, not to be confused with the Arthur Miller of you from the bridge. This is the view from the bridge. <laughs> well, I don't think Arthur Miller wrote for Star Trek, so I think this would be uh... <laughs> not as far as well, not under, not under his own name. Yeah. A... And and, and, <laughs> and like me, Nicholas Meyer is from Manhattan, so you know that's... I, I, I'm I'm shocked from, that all you Manhattan your neighbor. guys get together. Yeah. Actually, I've already found, you know, I need to I need to send I've already found just in starting to read it, like two people, you know, this this is like New York, uh, you know. One one of one of the Hollywood uh, one of the directors he knew, um, I think the guy's brother was my eye doctor for a while, and huh. then and then one of and then an editor who I think had ultimately rejected a novel of his though was my upstairs neighbor, you know. So yes, that is, you know, so that, that was very weird. Uh, well, on the topic of books, well, anyway, uh, yeah, you got so, so that that's how that's how the Eliza thing started. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, on the topic of books, you've got a new book uh, that you yeah. have been a pretty busy promoted, promoting. And there's a couple of questions uh, we have waiting here. But can you tell us uh, tell us what is the new book and uh, tell us a little bit about it? About um, Jack Ruby. Uh, right. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you looked like you, were, you had a question mark there for a minute. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Roland's there for you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not, 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 even without cue cards, I would have figured that out. About 12 years ago, because it, it, there is sort of a, a comics graphic novel connection. But I was never somebody obsessed with the Kennedy assassination, although I was 10 years old when it happened. You know, if you do the math, if you're old I am now, but um, I'd rather you didn't. But um, <laughs> about 12 years ago, leading up to the um, 50th anniversary of the, of the Kennedy assassination, I wanted to do, um, I was looking for a project to do. And I um, was in touch with Howard Zimmerman, who some of you may know from Starlog, some of you may know from his work for yeah. Bond and Price. How, you know, I worked for, mm. after Marvel, I spent a couple of years working as an editor at Byron Price. And uh, I forget which came first, but someone said, what do you got? And I said, you know, it's coming up on the 50th anniversary. Maybe there'd be a market for a graphic novel about the Kennedy assassination, which I'm, I'm interested in. I wasn't, I just wasn't obsessed. And okay, what do you got, you know? And I, and I started doing research in a way that I hadn't. And if you know my books, you know that I have an interest in um, interesting Jewish American figures, you know, going from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby right. um, to, you know, about, you know to the comic, the comic creators. I wrote a book called mm -hmm. Disguised as Clark Kent, Jewish Comics and Creation of the Superhero. Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys were from the same background as my parents, as my aunts and uncles, as me. So it's sort of, yeah. okay, here's Jack Ruby. Oh, my God. This is really a greatest generation Eastern Euro children of Eastern European Jewish immigrant story gone horribly wrong. I mean, this is, but I mean, so Jack Ruby from the same Chicago Jewish ghetto as Benny Goodman, William S. Paley, the founder of CBS, uh, Barney Ross, the boxer, you know, just. Uh, Arthur Goldberg, Supreme Court Justice. So I got more and more interested. Well, this is definitely my angle. And um, came up with a graphic novel pitch. I wrote a 180-page script. Um, Howard hooked me up with Rick, with the great Rick Geary. Um, mm -hmm. Rick did 10 sample, beautiful sample pages. 
We took it around to publishers. Every publisher said, this is great. I would buy it, but I can't finance it. Oh, don't you think if you would buy it? But anyway, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> this is great. I would, I would pay for it right <sighs> now, but I can't. So I just sort of, okay, whatever. It's not going to happen. I put it on a back burner. And then in the interim, I'd written books, including the Stan Lee biography in 2019, A Marvelous Life. And I said to my agent, do you think we could sell the Ruby thing just now that I'm a biographer? Do you think we could sell the Ruby book as a biography? And gosh darn it, uh, we did to Chicago Review Press. And so, and so that's, that's, you know, and, and there are, it's, you know, I guess me being me, you know, and my interest, there are actually some weird comics connections that you see in the book including the fact that Jack Kirby drew a Jack Ruby story for Esquire magazine. Really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, anyway, so, so I had to do a lot more research. Because, and so I decided to write, you know, had the deal and had a, you know, and, and a deadline, which is actually the writer's friend in a lot of, but yeah. especially, it was especially a deadline because this was now coming up on the 60th anniversary. So I realized early on and a, a, possibly a spoiler alert, I did not solve the mysteries of the Kennedy assassination. All right, I'm out. Thanks, everybody. See ya. <laughs> I, I, you know, all the end of your book. You that's, know, that's it. So, but, you know, when you write about it, you know, everybody, look, you have, to, you have to have a certain amount of arrogance to write a book about anything. And then when you're writing about the Kennedy assassination, I mean, not to trivialize the Kennedy assassination, but the only thing that I've come across that's nearly as controversial as the Stan Lee versus Jack Kirby, who did what, <laughs> is the who did what in the Kennedys. I oh, mean, yeah. It, oh, yeah. There, there is a frighteningly similar um, pushback you get. So, um, I thought, okay, yeah, so if, if you're arrogant enough to write a book, you really do think, I bet I can solve it. I bet I'll put some, and then <laughs> early on, I went, okay, I'm not that smart, you know. There are too many rabbit holes. There's too many stories. Okay, so what am I going to do? I will tell the story of this really interesting, bizarre guy who, because he was in show business um, with the strip club, but he also owned country western clubs. So, Jack, oh, in case people don't know, Jack Ruby is the guy who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. And right, right. Okay. <laughs> If there's anybody and of like, course, Lee Harvey Oswald is the guy who killed Kennedy. So, who allegedly killed Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. We, all right. Didn't, we didn't solve that, Roland. I'm That's sorry. Right. I, I apologize. We're still researching. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Ruby, because he was in show business, Jack Ruby, the last person to give regular work to Hank Williams Sr. Right? Really? Jack Ruby. Uh, the people who show up in this book include Jack, include Hank Williams, Mickey Mantle. Um, uh, you know, Candy Barr, uh, Mickey Cohen, uh, the gangster, uh, um, just uh, a wide array of, of like, of, of, uh, of, um, bold faced names from, from history and pop culture. And, and what I did also, I had access, you know, the, if anybody remembers the Chicago Seven trial and what a circus that was, it was even yes. if you just saw the movie. The biggest circus trial before that was the Jack Ruby trial, and I have and 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 I became I got it. I, I, I'm reading. I go, oh, oh, here's this guy, Jack's rabbi, a guy named Hillel Silverman. Do you know the movie Weekend at Bernie's? Yes, starring Jonathan Silverman. His yes. father was Jack Ruby's rabbi. No way! Oh my gosh! Awesome. <laughs> so, so and he just this guy just died like six, like less than a year ago at age ninety nine. Uh, and wow. of course, the last question anybody asked him was, was it a conspiracy, right? <laughs> the, rabbi took a deep in, the rabbi visited Ruby every other day in prison. And, I, and somebody introduced me to him, and I interviewed him. And he says to me, he said, you know, I'm almost, it was 10 years ago, he said, I'm almost 90. I can hardly see. I'm not writing my book anymore. Would you like my notes from when I visited Jack in prison every other day for four months? I went, yeah, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I you know I'm I don't think I'm the only person who's seen them, but I've never I've right. made what I did was I took the notes, which are mind blowing, and I intercut them with you know, with with the history of what was going on in the world and the conspiracy right. theories and 
and the trial transcript and Melvin Belli, this flamboyant lawyer, oh, and the prosecutor you might have heard of, the prosecuting attorney was Henry Wade, as in Roe v. Wade. So he's in the <laughs> story. Jeez. Um, so it's, so it, it, and then, and then the other thing I did, so I interviewed the rabbi and then I, um, through a guy named Steve North, who is a producer and journalist, um, who knew both the rabbi and he knew the, um, the families of Ruby's rival strip club owners in Dallas. So I, so that's the point of, so I figured I'm not solving the case. Let me talk, let, you know, let me do a deep dive, talk to these people whose parents and, you know, whose families knew and hated Ruby, you know, so I, tr so, th and then, and then there's, there's, there's just a lot of interviews around, like say in the, in what had been the book depository that's now an archive, mm. it's, it's an archive. there's thousands of interviews. They interviewed me, <laughs> which was weird, but there's thousands of interviews with, with people who knew Ruby people from the time. So that was, and I will tell you one wild story that's after the fact, but it's, it ties in with the book. Um, one of the people who performed at Ruby's club was uh, Gabe Kaplan from Mr. Cotter. Oh. <laughs> and he's on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast about four years ago. I will say, I will see, I will say needlessly before Gilbert died. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he's on there and he tells, starts telling this story about he's 19 years old. He's driven like for two days without sleep with a bunch of strippers from Buffalo because they hear there's work in Dallas. <laughs> and they get the Dallas, the auditions for Jack Ruby, and he uses a, he tells a joke. It's a joke. It, it, it's about how Dracula um, would be more attracted to a woman's neck than her breasts. And he uses a he uses a more colloquial term for breasts. I don't know what the uh, the rating on the show is. Right. <laughs> the T word. <laughs> Ruby hits the ceiling. Ruby, who's like. Who has a life of like violence and 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 you know just disgusting uh, behavior? Hits the what do you think? Is it a toilet? You think I run a toilet here? <laughs> you know, the, the police in Dallas were very strict, you know. So he, he hits the ceiling as he was wont to do, and you know, and then he calms down. And uh, the next day he sees um, Gabe Kaplan at a, at a at a poker game, and uh, he brings Kaplan a Dracula, like a kid's Dracula mask from like a Halloween costume. Here, yeah, use this next time you, you do that routine. You know, it'll be even funnier. And and don't worry, I'll call you to come to, to really perform my club. Well, two months later, two months later. Okay, so that that's funny enough. And I I so I, you know, I love that story. I, I put it in the book, and I luckily cite everybody. You know, from from Kaplan to get to uh, Gilbert to Frank Santo Padre, you know, who's co-host and producer. Cut to I am giving a talk in Dallas at the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, where everybody in that room was 10 years old when it happened in Dallas. And so I'm looking around the room and one guy looks familiar in the audience, but everybody kind of looks familiar, you know? And I'm, you know, took, and, I, and, I'm, and I relate that story and I have a picture of Gabe Kaplan when he was Mr. Cotter. And I go to sit down to sign books and a guy comes up, and I say, who should I make it out to? And he says, can make it out to Gabe. And I go, holy shit, you're Gabe Kaplan, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a surreal moment. And uh, then, you know, and he and I, we went out to dinner, and uh, it was very, but it was oh, very cool. I did not expect, you know, he, he has mostly been a professional poker player. Right. And, he, and he lives part-time in Dallas. So I think a friend of his told him some guy's talking about Jack Ruby, who, you know, who was who was an instrumental person in his life in his, when he was a teenager. Um, so it's been a weird trip. I mean, it, it, it's definitely different than writing about comics. You know, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, we, we sort of. Well, we have a we have a comment here from David A. Scutarez. He says, "Love the Ruby book. Wondered what made you focus on him." And wondered what is your favorite <laughs> Kennedy conspiracy theory? Well, we answered the answer the first part. I answered the first part. Yeah. Who was that from? Can I see the name again? Was that yeah, David? yeah, David A. Scuterez. Oh, hi, David. Um, yeah, what is your favorite, favorite conspiracy theory? Wow. I don't. You know, I don't. 
There's a lot of good ones. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite because I've sort of been, I've been sort of careful to to give voice to them or the, some of the less, what I think are the less crazy ones while, you know, I call myself agnostic on it. You know, I, yeah. you know, I don't want to, you know, which is gets me into trouble with people on both sides. You know, people who are hundred percent convinced the Warren commission, Come on, pick a side. people hundred percent, you know, convinced. Um, so I, well, I don't know because, let me ask you. The, he, he's I'm got a second looking, question. I'm looking, I'm looking for a smart ass answer, but really, it's it's. I mean, I mean, it's easy. Like one of the, it's easy. Jack Ruby was kind of a as comical as Jack Ruby could be, and as bizarre and 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 almost fictionalized as he could be. He did walk up and kill the guy who was supposed to yeah. be the most heavily guarded person in the world at point yeah. blank range. So I mean. Whatever amusement we find in him, I always have to come back to the fact. Like, uh, so I don't. I don't know if I have a favorite, but that, yeah, I'll think about that, and you can watch the next podcast I'm on, and I'll have to try to have an answer. <laughs> and you'll answer it, then, yeah. <laughs> well, he has a, he has a second question here. He says that uh, Ruby struck me as someone who strongly reflected the wants and desires of those around him more than someone with a strong direction of his own. Who was he to you? Who he was to me. My, my, he could have been my weirdest cousin, unless unless I myself am my own weirdest cousin. You know? <laughs> that was the that was the weird thing about him is that he was so familiar to me because he was from a similar background to my own family members. Um, so that thing, yeah, he did like to please people. He was. You know, I, I think he was involved in surviving. He, you know, the thing about both him and Oswald is that they both had long histories of mental illness. They were nuts. Whether they were long, lone nuts is, of course, the, the question. question. Yeah. Right. Um, but they both, um, so he was a fascinating figure uh, because he was, he was simultaneously familiar to me and yet totally alien to me. I sort of, you know, you know, Jack Ruby types. There's a weird way. I went into it very naively, you know. Yeah. I, I think in some way, I almost thought of him as a as a more violent Ralph Crandall. You know, <sighs> if you look at the way he's built and, and he moves. He trained as a boxer. His best friend was Barney Ross, who was a who was a famous middleweight boxer. So I almost at a certain point thought of Ruby as that, you know, um, as almost a Jackie Gleason. Yeah, I. I after researching, then you just, you just realize, oh, yeah, he was, you know, involved in much more sinister and, and, and horrible enterprise. Right. But he also could be very, as many stories as there are of Jack Ruby, like beating the shit out of somebody and then going, oh, my God, what am I doing? You know, in some kind of fugue state. There are as many stories of him being generous to people mm -hmm. and literally giving blood, <laughs> you know. I mean, so, it, you know. Um, some, I mean, somebody in a recent interview I did asked me what, that if he hadn't killed Oswald, you know, what, what, what would have become of him? And, and, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that was a question I'd sort of thought about, but not until that person articulated it in quite that way. Yeah. So, I mean, I think his agenda was survival and I think, and I think he wanted in some weird way. He wanted to be in show business. He, 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 there's a there's a picture that I that I just knew I had to have in the book. Um, you know, I didn't have a big photo budget or any photo budget, but there was, I, I there was this one photo of Ruby, kind of in a tada kind of you know like like you know like a singer ending a song you know right it's him next to a 12-year-old black kid who went by the professional name of Liddy, Little Daddy Nelson. And Ruby was managing him uh, until a second mother showed up and claimed she was the kid's mother. And But so Ruby had these show business dreams. He would act as his own MC and tell Joe. So, I, you know, he wanted to be 
known and loved and maybe famous, but you know, but but famous in that kind of showbiz way, you know. And and he he yeah. was he was sort of, you know, he was a real character around around town. Um, so yeah, but but I think ultimately survival. Um, in economically and survival with his own inner demons. Mm. You know, he had this very complicated, crazy family. You know, I mean, you'll see, you'll see in the book, it's just a, you know, so as close as I can tell, I think survival was, was his main, his main agenda. Mm. Well, I'm looking at my clock and we have certainly passed our uh, hour mark. Is there, <laughs> is there anything that uh, we didn't ask that uh, you want to, um, you want to say? Uh, Mason has a question. I have a question. <laughs> okay. What's the next book? Um, I have a few different things I'm working on. Something pop culture, probably not comics. Um, but so I'm not trying to, well, I'm being a little coy, but it will be more, more exploration into popular culture and its, and its effect on society. Um, I'm involved now, actually, in um, – I'm still promoting the book, and I'm, and I'm looking to um, sell it as a streaming series or movie. You know, Same with the Stan Lee book, actually. So if anybody out there um, is in that business, uh, I'd certainly be interested. It would be Jack Ruby. Uh, it would be called Jack Ruby, yes. That, uh, yeah. yeah, but who would play him in the movie? Oh, who would play him? I'm thinking. Is this good? Or, uh, you know, I have no idea. If it's the kind of thing it's good. I guess I. I'm thinking maybe um, Seth Rogen at this point. Especially if you've seen him in the in the Fablemans, you know, in a straight role, he was very oh, yeah. good. So he thinking, would be good. Yeah, yeah. So um, he's about he's about a good age too now. He's not yeah, uh, he's not a kid well, anymore. Yeah, and he could play <laughs> younger and older. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if he's at, if Seth, if you're out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening, yeah, hey, we got a project for you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, David A. Scutres has a final question here. He says, "Are you a fan of James Elroy's '60s trilogy?" David, I have not read it, but now that you've said that, I now will go out and 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 uh, read them. So, <laughs> is there any one of the trilogy in particular that? Uh, well. You worked in comics long enough, you know. You, you have started the first one. Started the first one, right? <laughs> right. And then Spider Man shows up in the third issue. That's <laughs> right. Of course, the other thing that I'm uh, Will Eisner week is a is a big thing. Uh, that right. I'm, it's coming up in March. Um, but I, actually, I've just uh, redone my website, so it's now robust. And, uh, <laughs> be, be very clear. I'll start with American Tablet. Okay, David, I'll do yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, um, well, America loves a robust website. Yeah, it's a it's That's robust, right. <laughs> it's robust and, uh, and sparkling, and uh, and, um, and, it, and it's the very uh, clever dannyfingeroth.com. So, um, oh, there we go. Right. There, there you go. go. So, so uh, all you guys listening live, and those of you who who didn't catch us live but are listening on the replay, go to dannyfingeroth.com. And can they get copies of your book there as well? Um, you know, if, you send them somewhere. Yes, yeah, there links there. You know, it's a, it's at all the usual suspects. And okay. I guess the other thing to plug is I, I would love to come talk to your group, uh, whoever you may be, about uh, Jack Ruby or Stan Lee, uh, online, or if you have some kind of budget to bring me in person to your fine city. Um, I've been known. I've been known to go to Dallas. That was a weird, <laughs> that was a weird, thing, that was a weird thing to say to people like. Uh, I'm going to Dallas in November. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in November. So, so uh, we've been threatening here, Tom and I've talked about it a little bit. We've been threatening to kind of do a, a, a couple of, uh, a couple of different uh, Sundays on, on editing, editing comic books in particular. Would you be interested in coming back and, and participating in that as we talk about maybe editing corporate comics? I can't say no, can I? You've asked me on uh, well, well, you can't. You can't. You could. <laughs> you, you, you know, the the the, uh, the the answer is always well. It depends, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it depends on my calendar. It depends on my calendar. There you go. Okay. Okay. See, you did, and you did that without a publicist. So you. <laughs> that's a brilliant you, you, my publicist is right. You, you think I did that? I, I have Marshall McLuhan over here. 
I, uh, <laughs> yes, I would be. I would be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, that would be. That would be a lot of fun. I think. Uh, I think it's something. That, uh, we all have opinions, of course, about uh, comic editing and and having you haven't done a bunch of that. I know that we often think a lot of people don't have n no clue what comic book editors do, and so um, so yeah, we've kind of kicked around. We should we should dive into a couple of those uh, different episodes sometimes. So yes. Uh, that, that's uh, Okay. Any final words before I launch into the the final stuff here? Tom, Tommy, Roberta, Mike. No. It's been great. It's been great seeing Danny. I always see Danny once a year now. So what a pleasure. Uh, yes. and, and yes. this, is like, this is if you can't the lunch we had in San Diego. It's like we've seen each other twice in less than a year. It, it's 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 fabulous. And if I make it to New York, well, you'll probably see me again. You so, better. All right. And where are you? Where are you? Where are you in Canada? Where are you? Oh, I'm on Vancouver Island, as far west as you can get before you fall into the sea. Oh, that's nice. Of Vancouver Island. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just speaking gig in Vancouver Island. Ooh, well, you know. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, come I'm on just out. speaking gig in Vancouver Island. <laughs> yeah, come on out. The weather's terrible. I love the, I love the, North, I love the Northwest. <laughs> I do. I'm a big fan of the Northwest. Oh, that's right. I'm good for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and then uh, I'm just tiresome. And, and then he's run through all so, of the material. And, and, and so you and I have that in common. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's my wife. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. On the uh, 13th, uh, on this coming Tuesday, our uh, that Silverland show on Tuesday, the guys will be talking about uh, using icon iconography in comics. The team discusses how to use icons, memes, and societal concepts to quickly convey ideas in comics. And as uh, Wednesday is going to be Valentine's Day, the Wednesday Whammers have decided they're going to take the day off. I bet they're none of them do anything special for Valentine's Day. I don't but, either. They're, they're but just, they're just, taking they're, the day off anyway. They're comic book people. What what does Valentine's I, that's Day? That's what mean? I'm saying. Uh, next week, A horrible cliche. We, yeah, we I, will I, be back with former Malibu assistant editor Kara Lamb, and I'm sure Tom has all kinds of. Uh, nifty uh stories about kara so kara yeah, has agreed went, to she went into politics did she go into politics really yeah she would she was uh she was working uh, pr for uh, uh uh somebody in colorado uh, i know she, i know she's in colorado so yeah. but i did not realize she was in, in politics but she has agreed to come on and 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 chat with us so um that's what we'll have uh, uh next week uh and and we uh we we have already asked uh, danny if he would be willing to do this so so, Denny, I'm going to pop you up big screen, and we're going to sign out. You're going to say what uh, what I asked you to say here, and then we're going to go to the stream. If you uh, if you would like to hang out a little bit after the end of the the, sure. the broadcast, we'll we'll chit chat just a little bit. Okay. All right. So let me bring you up uh, big screen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your questions tonight. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Make mine silver line. What? <laughs> hold on, Danny. We got to do a second take. Oh. You you you, you, you want. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm comic book uh, writer and editor and book book author, Danny Fingeroth. And I'll say what uh, I always say, which is make mine silver line. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul Kupperberg. Make mine silver line.